यशो मति नंदन ब्रज बारंधाग जसमति नंदन ब्रज बारंधाग गोकुल रंजन खाना
All of you, ki. Samaveda Bhakta Vrinda ki. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maha Mantra ki. Jai. Hare Krishna Maha Mantra ki. Okay, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, The Pandavas Retire Timely, verse number 42. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Tritve Hulvacha Panchatvam Tatschakatvam Joho Munihi Sarva Atmalya Juhavad Brahma Atmanam Avaye Tritva Hurva Japanchatvam Tatschata Chatta Twe Juho Munihi 
Close that fan. I'm finished if you keep that fan on. <laughs> Sarva Atmam Ajuva Hibid. Brahma Atmanam Avyaye. Tritve Hudva Japanchatvam. Tatsavkatwe Juho Munihi. Sarva Atman Yajuva Vid. Brahma Atmanam Avyaye. Can somebody chant louder than that? Let's see if anybody can chant louder than that. Some, any volunteers? You have won the prize. The highest, most voluminous chanter in Gopinath Temple. <laughs> but if everyone was like that, then Krishna would personally appear. <laughs> and congratulate you. <laughs> Anyone else? Way into the three qualities. Hudva, having offered. Cha, also. Panchatum, five elements. Tat, that. Cha, also. Ekatwe, in one nations. 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 <laughs> Ajuhot, amalgamated, Muni, the thoughtful, Sarvam, the sum total, Atmani, in the soul, Ajuvavit, fixed, Brahmani, in, unto the spirit, Atmanam, the soul, Avaye, Unto the inexhaustible. So what is being described here is Yudhisthira Maharaj is departing the body, but he's using the, the yogic method of merging the different elements of the bodies into themselves and then merging everything into the mind and merging the mind into the total material energy or into the 
false ego, then the false ego into the total material energy, and then ultimately extinguishing all material encumbrances and then merging himself, the soul, or not merging, but delivering himself back to the Brahma Jyoti or the unmanifested spiritual energy. So this is the process that's being described here. So the translation describes that. Thus annihilating the gross body of the five elements into the three qualitative modes of material nature, he merged them into one nescience and then absorbed that nescience into the self. Brahman, which is inexhaustible and in all circumstances. Hmm, purport. All that is manifested in the material world is the product of Mahatattva Avyakta. And things that are visible on our material vision are nothing but combinations and permutations of such variegated material products. So everything you see is a combination of material energies. That's all. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego, Krishna says, these make up the unmanifested, uh, the manifested material energy. And they are manifested and unmanifested accordingly. So everything you see is just a combination of these things, even including your own body. There's nothing outside of that. But the living entity is different. That's you. You're different from such material products. It is due to the living entity's forgetfulness of his eternal nature as an eternal servitor of the Lord and his false conception of being a so-called Lord of material nature that he is obliged to enter into the existence of false sense enjoyment. So because of our wrong mentality, thinking that we are the controller and the enjoyer of material energy, we enter into this false idea of enjoyment. Hmm. Thus, a concomitant generation of material energies is the principal cause of the mind being material affected. So the mind is affected because we identify with all of these combinations of material energies as the extensions of our activities in this world, which we either try to control or we try to enjoy. And actually, the controlling and enjoying are connected because in order to enjoy, you have to ha have some element of control. So these two principles make up the living entity's attempt to enjoy in this world. Thus, the physical body of five elements is produced. Maharaj Yudhisthira reversed the action and merged the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether, of the body into the three modes of material energy, goodness, passion, and ignorance. The qualitative distinction of a body as being good, bad, or mediocre is extinguished, and again, the qualitative manifestations become merged into the material energy, which is produced from this false sense of the pure living being. So this whole material world is due to our desire to enjoy. Krishna creates this material world. He creates it. He also enjoys the fact of that creation, but he creates it so we can facilitate our desire to enjoy separate from him. So everything, either good, bad, or in between, is simply a combination of these different elements. And we give them names, oh, this is good, this is bad, this is in between, but all of these are just, just mental speculation. It's all bad. <laughs> As Lord Chaitanya explains that some people say this is good, and some people say this is bad, but as far as I can see, this is all mental speculation because everything in this world is bad. Haribo. <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> okay, so, and again, okay, when one is thus inclined to become an associate of the Supreme Lord, the personality of Godhead, in one of the innumerable planets of the spiritual sky, especially Goloka Vrindavan, one has to think always that he is different from the material energy. So before you can actually elevate yourself to the spiritual world, you have to know you don't have anything to do with or you are distinct from everything in this world. You are different. You are pure spiritual energy. 
which you are connected with the supreme energy and devotion. And before you can attain that level of spiritual existence in the higher planets, such as the Loka Vrindavan or in, in Vaikuntha, one has to know he's not the body. He's a pure spiritual being. And he has nothing to do with it at the same time. You have to know it, and you have to know that you have nothing to do with this world. Brahman quality equals the supreme bomb. Paramatma. Maharaj Yudhisthira, after distributing his kingdom to Parikshit and Braj, did not think himself emperor of the world or head of the Kuru dynasty. So he gave up even his identity as being this king. He had ruled the world for many hundreds of years on behalf of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Powerful, and he is known throughout the scriptures and when he was personally present as a powerful em emperor. But now he's giving up that whole idea that he ever was even such a personality. His, his identity is no longer connected with anything material. The sense of freedom from the material relations, as well as freedom from material engagement of the gross and subtle encirclements, makes one free to act as a servitor of the Lord, even though one is in the material world. So even though one is in, still in the material world, one can serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead without any encumbrances due to this, the arrangement of the material energy. In other words, devotional service is, is transcendental or free from the influence of everything material. <laughs> hmm. This stage is called Jiva Mukta stage. That means a living entity has reached its liberation. Even in the material world, even while you're still in this body, you can be free from the effects of the material energy and engage fully in devotional service to the Lord. This is a process, this is the process for ending material existence. One must not only think that he is pure spirit, but he must act like that. One who only thinks himself as Brahman in an impersonal way, and one who thinks himself only as spirit, but with no connection to the Supreme Spirit, is considered to be an impersonalist. And one who acts like Brahman is a pure devotee. So in other words, if you identify yourself as Brahman without connecting that pure spiritual self to the Supreme Self in devotional service, um, you have reached a certain level of God realization which is called preliminary. In other words, you understand I'm not this body. That's all. But that doesn't get you any very far. I mean, in that level of realization, you can attain to the Brahman Jyoti, but that attainment, as it's explained in the scriptures, is also temporary. And if you fall down from the Brahma Jyoti, usually the Gyanis and the Yogis attain the Brahma Jyoti, and they fall back down into this material world and they become a stone. Haribo. <laughs> Not very good future, huh? Become a stone. <laughs> So you don't get much, you get some relief temporarily from material existence. You're enjoying the happiness of ma no material suffering or no material encumbrances. But at the same time, uh, after some time, it's this feeling of happiness without any um, object of that happiness. It's just an internal experience. But it's temporary because no one can stay in the Brahma Jyoti. Why? Because the Brahma Jyoti is simply a place for temporary realization of oneself as of spirit. It's the first step in God realization. Therefore, one has to go to the higher step and to realize that one is Jivar Surupai Krishna and Jadas. That my real identity is a servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And those who climb very high on the spiritual platform and reach um, jnana, what we say, uh, realization that they are not this material body and are situated in Brahman realization, Aruna Krich Chena Padam Padam Padantiyada, they fall down again into the material world. As we mentioned, they become a stone. 
a very good future. But there are those who engage in devotional service, because in, even if you reach the Brahman effulgence, you can go higher by taking up devotional service. Then when one takes up devotional service, then one elevates himself to the complete understanding of the relationship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That the Supreme Lord is a person, and I am also a person. We are eternally a person, so we never become one. Sometimes there is this class of spiritualists, they say, the perfection of life is to lose your identity and merge into the greater spirit whole, and therefore you become perfect, you also become that spirit whole. But the soul cannot merge because the soul is individual. My mam so jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana. So Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, you are my parts and parcels, and eternally parts and parcels. Even when you reach perfection, you do not lose your identity as a pure spiritual entity. And your identity becomes uh, realized as a spiritual being when you reach the stage of pure devotional service. In other words, you understand who you are, or you experience, not understand, you experience your actual spiritual identity. Just like we have this material body, and we have a certain identity. We may be in a particular social, or political, or economic category, a particular family, a particular gender. All of these make up our material, material identity. So it's not that when we become pure, we lose all identity. We actually attain to our real identity. And in that real identity, we actually have a particular spiritual form that we serve the Supreme Lord in the spiritual world in that form. So we never lose our individuality and we never lose that connection with Krishna. And it's always based on one principle, a service. <laughs> service. So the whole process of devotional service is that the whole process of Krishna consciousness is to elevate one to pure devotional service or become a, a, absorbed in serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Devotional service is the constitutional nature of all living entities. It is not far from the soul's existence. As we identify with the material body, we take up material activities and we identify them as our occupation or our, or our different goals in life. But we forget who we actually are in that uh, activities in the material world. And our success in the material world depends on what we can get in the material world and what we can enjoy temporarily in this material world. And we use the word temper because that's the nature of this world. Nothing is everlasting. But we never lose our actual identity and our position as pure spirit soul, even if we forget it. Because that, that pure identity always stays with us all the time. It's just like when you go to sleep at night, you forget what you, who you are on the waking level. It doesn't mean you lose that waking identity while you're sleeping. It's there, but you're not aware of it, that's all. So in the same way, we never lose our real identity as pure spiritual beings, but we forget it. <laughs> And but because we forget it, we think we're something different then. Just like you might be in a dream state and you might be experiencing something there. You might be being chased by a tiger or you might see a beautiful girl. Or you might see something and you start f thinking that that is actually the reality of your, pre your existence. But because you're absorbed in the dream, you can't see anything outside of that. So this material world is a dream. That's all. So sometimes people say, well, you know, when I dream at night, you know, I, I wake up and it's over in a few seconds, but this is, you know, this goes on for a while, this one. So Prabhupada would say, it's just a longer dream, that's all. <laughs> You're more asleep in this time when you are than when you go to sleep at night. <laughs> it's a longer state of sleep. <laughs> And so, in order to come back to our real, because if you don't come back to who your real self, you can never be happy. Or never, you can never satisfy your needs for enjoyment at any place. So we have to come to Krishna consciousness. 
And that means serving the Supreme Lord in devotion. And when one takes up devotional service, then one begins to awaken and reveal one's actual spiritual nature. And one can understand that I am not this material body. It's something that's been given to me, and it soon will end at a certain time. So a devotee, or one engaged in devotional service, doesn't worry so much what will happen to the material body. It's the same thing that happens to every material body. At some point it ends. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> but if you want to get another material body, you can get one. <laughs> They're available. But we don't want another material body, even if it's a better material body. Who can guarantee one gets getting another material body that's better? You never know. Just like we have the example of King Nirga. King Nirga was a, a very charitable king. He had a lot of wealth, and he liked to use his wealth to serve the Brahmin class. And so, he was giving many cows and various types of clothing, jewelry, and other riches to the Brahmanas. He was very charitable to the Brahminical class. He understood his position. So one particular incident, he gave a thousand cows to one Brahmin. And then not long after that, he gave another thousand cows to another Brahmin. Now, the, one of the cows from the first Brahmin he gave wandered into the herd of the second Brahmin. And so there seemed to be a little bit of a problem because the first Brahmin said, well, this cow that's in your herd is my, is my cow. No, it's not your cow, it's my cow. Who, what do you mean it's your cow? No, no, he gave it to me. No, he actually gave it to me. So they started arguing amongst themselves, this is my cow. Because the Brahmins have this idea that, you know, the Brahmins, Brahmins' property is considered to be like as good as the property of the Supreme Lord. So there was a big argument, and then, but King Nirga said, don't worry, I'll give you each another 10,000 cows. They said, no, no, that's not the problem. This is my cow, no, no, this is my cow. So they were going back and forth. So they got angry at King Nirga and they walked away and they cursed him. And because of that, he was destined to take birth in a lower species of life. And so he died, and then he came before Yamaraj, and Yamaraj said, what do you want? You want the benefit of your pious activities first, or you want the results of your sinful activity first? So he wasn't very intelligent. <laughs> he said, give me the results of my sinful activity first. He was thinking, I get that out of the way, then I can enjoy again. But he doesn't know that if you take your pious activities first, you can somehow, if you come to the level of devotional service, then you can nullify the effects of your, your sinful activities. But he wasn't so intelligent. So he took that, and then he, then he took birth as a lizard. So all of his charitable work, all of his activities to give benedictions and gifts to others simply turned in to a reaction to where he had to take birth as a lizard. And of course, the story goes on that uh, two of Krishna's children were playing in the area and they were playing ball and the ball fell into a well and in the bottom of the well, they went to pick up the well, the ball, but they saw a lizard there. And that was King Nirga. <laughs> he was in the well. So they saw the lizard. And then Krishna came by and they showed, oh, the, Krishna, there's, there's a lizard in here. So Krishna picked him up. <laughs> and Krishna picked him up. He came back into a, a different form, just maybe by being touched by the Supreme. So he got some mercy at the end. But... He had to go through this lizard birth of suffering this lower species of life, although he didn't do anything wrong. But that's the way things are in the material world. You can be a nice person, but if you do something wrong by accident or by circumstance, 
you get a reaction from that. It doesn't matter how nice you are. It's the way the material energy works. It's like this. So it's a place where uh, anything can go wrong at any time. I was just thinking of one particular story. This happened here in Mumbai many years ago. How, how this material energy is... We can't guarantee anything in this material energy because at any time the material energy can just close in, you, in on you and therefore everything could be over. This happened to here. I was here at the time. This was about 20 years ago. We were preaching in JJ Medical College, I think it was. Yeah. And the devotees were having sanghas in this medical college here in Mumbai. And uh, we, were, we were having regular programs, and the students were coming to our programs, and many of them were becoming quite regular and practicing Krishna consciousness. So this went on, and one of the students, who was one of the best of our the devoted, the persons who were practicing devotional service, he started to talk to his fellow students, and he said, you know, this Krishna consciousness is nice, but I want to graduate top in my class. So I'm not going to come to the classes anymore. I'm not going to visit the temple. I'm simply going to study my books and I'm going to try to get the best grade in the whole school. So his friend said, all right, but after you're done, come back. You know. <laughs> so he left and never came back to the, so it was about three or four months before graduation, so he started to study his books very seriously. And when graduation came, it was understood that he was number one in the whole college. He became the best in the entire school. So he was given all kinds of awards for being the best student. And so now he was graduated, and then that same night, his friend said, oh, you know, okay, come back, the devotees are here. He said, well, you know, uh, there's a party tonight, so I want to go to the party. <laughs> and his friend said, all right, you go to the party, we're going to go with the devotees. <laughs> so he went to the party, and what do you do at a party? You know, you, I don't know, I haven't been to any parties in a long time. The only party I go to is Kirtan. <laughs> that's, the, that's a real party. <laughs> And, you don't have, and, you, and the intoxication lasts for a long time, and there's no after effects. There is after effects, but it's good. <laughs> so, we, uh, so he was dancing at the party, and he had a heart attack and died that same night. He was a top medical student in the school, 23 years old, perfect, in perfect health, and all of a sudden, he just died on the dance floor with his friends. And uh, his fr his, when his fellow students who were coming to our temple found out about that, they became really serious. <laughs> and they, they started to increase their Krishna consciousness. Of course, it was a very sad situation. I was here at the time. And I remember, you know, yeah, we all felt very bad. Uh, here was a person who was making nice progress, but he decided to stop his Krishna consciousness for some material success. And he got the material success, but he didn't get, he got something he wasn't expecting. So this is the nature of the material world, padam padam ya vi padam. It's a dangerous place, that whatever plans you make, there's no guarantee. The only plan you can make is the plan to get out of here. Yeah, because this material world is designed in such a way is to make sure you can't stay here and you can't be happy here. It's designed that way. And sometimes people say, well, why is it like that? Who did it? Whose fault is it? Who is the bad creator? And then when the word gets back to Krishna, Krishna says, if you want to blame somebody, it's me. I did it. Why did I do it? Because I love you. I don't want you to stay separate from me. I want you to come back. So I made a place you can't stay, so you become eager to get, to get out of it. <laughs> That's Krishna. So Krishna does that because he loves his parts and parcel, and he hates to see them. He feels bad to see them suffering in the material world. 
So that's his mercy, that he creates a place you can be happy. But everyone is still trying, right? Everyone still tries, and they all, everyone thinks, nobody's done it, but I'm different. I can do it. I'll somehow or other, I'm different, I'll be happy here. I'll be able to adjust everything just according to my plans. And you see, you know, you'll see no matter what your plans are, uh, those plans are not guaranteed because time and the material energy work under the control of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I remember we were, uh, Aradhana Swami Maharaj tells this story, it was his personal experience. There's a place in Rome, in, in the, the capital of Italy, which is also known as one of the, the cities where the, uh, the Christian, Christianity is thriving. But it's also a very sinful city. So there's one, one, uh, what does it say, monastery. When it's a big monastery in Rome, and when the monks die, they uh, they and they wait for the body to decompose, and then they take all of the bones, and they. Uh, display the skeletons of the bones in these different places in the monastery and for the view of people. And they take different parts of the body, the hip bone and the knee bone, and they make designs out of it. You get nice designs, you can put flowers. This was, this was George's hip bone, you know. So if you like that. So, and then you go to different sections and you see all of these different, and in the last section there's three skeletons there. And then there's a plate on the bottom with, some, with inscriptions in four languages, in English, in Italian, in French, and in German. And on the script, inscriptions it says, and it's, it's the idea is that the skeletons are talking to you. And it says, as you are now, I once was, and as I am now, you will be. <laughs> Good preaching, right? <laughs> so, Maharaj was describing this in one of his experiences when he was there, and he said there was one young couple who was reading the sign, and the girl said to her husband, I think we better go. <laughs> It's time to get out of here. <laughs> the message is too strong. <laughs> so, yeah, but this is the reality of the material world. Um, it's, not a, it's not a place where we can make our plans and su actually become successful. Therefore, Krishna arranges in such a way that he comes in the form of his name, his form, the deity. He comes in the form of prashadam. He comes in the form of transcendental knowledge just to bring us back to him in pure devotional service. So Maharaj Yudhisthira, he's, he has the personal association of Krishna. And by that association, he became fully purified. And for him to leave the world, it wasn't difficult at all. He had all the support he needed by his pure spiritual consciousness, having pure association with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So he had an advantage that for him to leave the world, he was able to, able to give up all, all of his ideas and designations instantly, just as soon as he was. Same with Maharaj Pariksit. When Maharaj Pariksit also learned that he had only seven days left, he was a powerful king. He was the follower, it says here in this purport, that Yudhisthira Maharaj distributed his kingdom to Pariksit Maharaj and to his grandson, Raja. And Pariksha Maharaj ruled the world for many, I'm not sure, hundreds of years. And it was time for him to leave. And he, he was still young in age and very powerful. He had complete control of the world. There was no opposing elements. But still, when he was cursed unfairly by this Brahmin boy, he, had, he was riding on his horse one day. He hadn't... He hadn't taken any food or drink for a long time, so he stopped at one hermitage. Not knowing who was living there, he came into the hermitage, he opens the door, and he sees the sage sitting in meditation. So he talks to the sage, but the sage is in meditation. 
and he asks for a drink of water. Now there's no response from the meditating sage. And so Maharaj Pariksha said, oh, you're a, you're a great yogi. Well, here's a garland. So he took a stick and it was a dead snake in the area and he put the, the dead snake around the yogi. Here's your garland. But what happened was this, 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 this sage, whose name was Shamik Rish, he had a son named Shringi. And Shringi found out about it and became angry that his father was insulted. So he was a Brahmin. And so he cursed Maharaj Pariksha to die in seven days to be bitten by a snake bird. And so when Maharaj Pariksha learned about the curse, now he, had, he was a great devotee of the Lord along with being a powerful king. He had the power to curse, to counteract the curse. But he didn't do it. He thought, here's, the, here's Krishna's arrangement. I can go back home, back to Godhead. Yeah. He gave up all of his power. He had a beautiful wife, nice family, complete loyalty with his subjects, complete control over the kingdom. Everything was perfect. He gave it all up, and sat down on the banks of the Jamuna. Some people say Ganges, some say Jamuna. And he was just fasting to death. All the sages all over the universe came to see this fasting king who was once the ruler of the whole world. They wanted to meet him. And they were all there. They all wanted to somehow or other help him in some way. But he wasn't able to take their help. And he wanted the help that they were going to give him. He wasn't interested. Finally, one great personality, Sukadev Goswami, 16-year-old boy, boy, came walking into the assembly. Soon as he came in, all of these sages and saints and great personalities, they all rose to their feet. He was the youngest among them, but he was the, the most learned and the most devoted. Everyone in respect honored Sukadev Goswami. He took the seat of honor. And then Maharaj Parikshit spoke and said, Please narrate to me the, the, the name, fame, form, pastimes, qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I want to hear this when I leave the body. So Sukadev Goswami then started to narrate the entire Srimad Bhagavatam from the very beginning. And for six full days he covered nine cantos. Maharaj Pariksha was so absorbed and he, would, he didn't think about eating, he didn't think about sleeping, he didn't think about any bodily needs, not even drinking water. He was so absorbed in hearing the glories of the Lord. This says something powerful, that the glories of the Lord are so attractive, not only for great personalities, but everyone can be attracted to the glories of the Lord. As we absorb ourselves in the glories of the Lord, we can forget about everything else and find complete satisfaction and achieve complete knowledge simply by absorbing ourselves and hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. So after six days, Sukadev Goswami stopped his narration and said, my dear king, you want, to, you want something, you want to take a little break, you want some water? Maharaj Pariksha became even more enthusiastic. No, no, this is what I've been waiting for. Please narrate Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. So when Sukadev Goswami heard that, he became more enthusiastic, yes. And he started to narrate, and he finished the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. In the 12th canto, it describes that after hearing everything, Maharaj Sukadev Goswami starts to give him basic instructions how to leave the body. But these instructions that he gave to Maharaj Pariksit weren't from Maharaj Pariksit because Maharaj Pariksit had already achieved perfect self-realization. He knew by realization he was not the body. When you know something theoretical, it's not enough. You have to know it by realization. Only by realization does the spiritual qualities take, in, take into account. Just like the example would be given, you walk into a restaurant, you sit down at the table, you pick up the menu, you read the menu, and you read the menu, and you enjoy what's being written on the menu, and you think, oh, wow, that was a great meal. You put the menu down, you leave. That's called theoretical understanding. <laughs>
only when you actually order what you like and then experience the taste and the happiness and the the strength you get from that, then you have the experience that's called realization. So in the same way, that there is that level of understanding of spiritual knowledge that comes by absorbing oneself in devotional service. And when Maharaj Pariksit came, was being spoken to by Sukadeva Goswami, he didn't need to hear that. He already achieved that state. But Sukadeva Goswami was doing it for all of us. That he was saying, don't be fearful, get ready, soon you will have to meet your destiny. And Maharaj Pariksit wasn't saying, no, no, I, I'm, a, I'm beyond that. He was listening in a very humble way. And he, he was absorbing himself. And finally, when it came, uh, Sukadev Goswami finished, Maharaj immediately left to sit down in meditation. And as he sat down in meditation, uh, the snake bird, uh, his name was Taksaka, mm -hmm. powerful bird. It was a bird that could fly and had tremendous amount of poison. He was approaching Maharaj Pariksit. And Kashyapa Muni comes and stops the snake bird. He says, your poison is not powerful enough. I can annihilate any poison that you give. So don't try even to, you know, do anything to Maharaj Pariksit. Tataksa said, my poison is powerful. No one can stop it. And... I'll demonstrate it. And he threw his, he shot his poison at this pipple tree. It burnt the whole tree to ashes. And he said, see, how powerful? And Kishapa Muni did his mantras and the tree came back to life. <laughs> Tadaksis thought, uh-oh, you know, I can't do my service. <laughs> so he was thinking what to do. So he bribed Kishapa with a lot of wealth and then Kashyapa got distracted, and, and then Tataksha took the form of a brahmana. And there were many other brahmanas sitting around Maharaj Pariksit when he was there. And no one could recognize that one of the brahmanas was actually the snake, snake bird, Tataksha. And then when no one was looking, he took his real form and he bit Maharaj Pariksit. And his body immediately burst into flames. But he was not only unaffected, he was not even feeling the pain of the fire. He was so fixed on self-realization that as soon as that happened, he actually re went back home, back to Godhead. It's explained for a, a pure soul, as soon as death comes, there's no time period between them leaving the body and entering back into the spiritual world. There's, you can't calculate any millisecond or millimillisecond. It's that fast for a pure devotee. The more material you are, the longer it takes to get your next body. <laughs> so the conditioned souls, when they die, they have to go to Yamaraj, and then he gives them the punishment, and then they have to wait, and they get another body. Sometimes it takes months before their new body comes. But for a and it's mentioned in the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's like instantaneous for the pure devotee that one immediately attains to the spiritual world. So that is actually our Asila Prabhupada. The spiritual world is our home. We have nothing to do with this material world. Even if it's a nice place, it's not so nice. <laughs> It'll be nice for a while, but after some time, Manaso de ho ge ho yo kichu mor arpilu tu abode nandikishur. Bhakti Vinoda course says, yeah, you may have so many things. You have your family, you have your possessions, you have your home, you have so many things. Even you have your own material body, but it all belongs to Krishna. <laughs> nandikishur. And so when we use it in the service of the Lord, then it becomes purified and it enters it takes on its actual spiritual essence. Because everything, ultimately, from the highest understanding of reality, there's no such thing as material. 
There's no such thing as material. Everything is spiritual in essence because everything is coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. What makes something material is that it gets cut off from the Lord due to the conditioned soul's desire to be separate. And that would makes it material. And even one's body, material body, can become fully spiritualized where it, even when you leave the body, it doesn't dis disintegrate. Mm -hmm. There's many examples of pure souls who have left their body and the body stays intact for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. There are many Christian saints who have achieved that status. If you go to Tirupati or Sri Rangam, Sri Rangam temple, you can see uh, they have taken Ramanujacharya, his body, You've seen that and placed it in some resin. But when you see it, you think, there's Ramanuja. He's still there. <laughs> it looks like he's still very much present. So, you know, the body of a great soul also doesn't undergo deterioration once it dies. It usually gets put into samadhi, and then from there it is worshipped. So... Um, this particular uh, episode here just shows how powerful devotional service is. Even if one has so many material successes, one can easily give it up and attain to the perfectional sage simply by engaging in pure devotional service. So pure devotional service is for everyone. And what is pure devotional service? Ayabila sita sunya, jnana kamana navritam anukulena krishna silanam bhakti uttama. Sometimes people ask, well, what is pure devotional service? You serve Krishna to please Krishna, that's all. You don't try to get anything from that service, no gain, no personal. I just want to serve Krishna to make Krishna happy. That's all. If you think in that way and you perform your activities with that in, with that mindset, then you're actually you're actually awakening or revealing your spiritual existence gradually. You, then at one point you actually come to self-realization to try to serve Krishna to please Krishna. But you have to f focus on pleasing Krishna, not just serving Krishna. Because the demons, they please Krishna also, but they don't get bhakti because they're not trying to, they're not trying to serve Krishna. They're trying to um, fight with Krishna and Krishna likes to fight, so they please Krishna. <laughs> but because they're not, they're, their intention is not to please Krishna, but they do please Krishna, even though their intention is not to please Krishna, they don't get the benefit of bhakti because you have to try to please Krishna. I want to please Krishna. And then try to serve in that way. And Krishna is easy to please. Patram pusram phalam toyam yome bhakta panasyati taraham bhakti uparutam asnami payatatmanaha that he's pleased simply by bhakti, that's all, by love. Doesn't matter what you offer, as long as you offer it with love. Of course, you have, you can, there's certain things you can offer. You can't um, offer sinful activities into to, to Krishna, even though everything is coming from Krishna still. You can't offer those things. You can't sit down and have your lunch and then whatever is left offered to Krishna. You can't do that either. <laughs> First you give it to him. So, yeah, so a devotee can please Krishna very easily simply by trying to please Krishna. And that is, that is bhakti. Okay, Hare Krishna. Thank you. Chila Prabhupada Ki Do we have time for questions? Or is there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But there's a microphone coming here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for the wonderful class. 
Maharaj, you said that uh, uh, King Nirga, when he went to Yamaraj, when he went to Yamaraj, he was not so intelligent by asking that he should get, uh, you know, the, the reactions for the punya. So can you a little bit elaborate why we should be thinking that way? Well, by performing some pious activities first, he could have came to devotional service. You can't come to devotional service when you're encumbered by impious activities. But that body that he had. So if he would have took his pious activities first, he could have obviously got a body to perform devotional service. Because you can't perform pious activities in a lower species. It's not possible. But he was thinking... Well, if I get my impious activities out of the way first, then I can really enjoy with no impediments, no interruptions. But he was thinking wrongly. If he would have took his pious activities first, there was a chance he could have came to the devotional service. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for a wonderful class. You talked about the material condition, right? And longer dream. A longer? Dream. The material yeah, yeah. life. Yeah. Material life is what it is. Yeah. Dream. So, my question is, a practicing devotee who goes through a long anartha nivritta stage, anartha is still nivritta? in the dream-like situation unless he reaches the ruchi? Uh, he, he goes through the dream like say, an anti nivritti you were saying? Yes, yeah, so my question is, he still is in the dream, dream-like situation condition, yeah. right? When he's in the anarthi yeah, yeah. So he doesn't uh, get into the real... No, he's like, not. He's still under the influence of the material energy. Sure, yeah. thank you. Yeah, before... Only when you come to the stage after anarthi is nishta. Nishta means I'm fixed in devotional service. I'm not going to fall away. And then nishta leads to ruchi. Ruchi means sweet taste. And that's the platform we want to aspire for, to get to the stage of ruchi, where one is experiencing the, the happiness of devotional service continuously. Mm -hmm. But anartha nivritti is, uh, is just a transition stage, that's all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for wonderful you. class. Maharaj, I have a question. Um, since uh, we have come from the spiritual world and we might be created for some purpose uh, by Krishna and uh, maybe some service we might be doing there. And he, now, in, this, in this world? In the spiritual world. Yeah, no. But since we are here now, is it so that uh, we are making Krishna deprive of that service we were? <laughs> well, Krishna misses you. He wants you back because he loves everyone. And um, you see the story of Gopal Kumara, how after so many attempts to come to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he finally achieved Goloka Vrindavan. And the picture is nicely displayed where Krishna greets his friend in a very loving way. So Krishna has that same loving feeling towards each and every one of his parts and parcels. But it's not that because you're not there, things are not going to get done. <laughs> things, <laughs> but it's just the, lo the separation of love that Krishna is feeling. Because he loves each and every part and parcel equally. <laughs> so that's, his, that's the nature of Krishna's love. It's, com it's complete. Yeah. And, and love does, is experienced by not wanting to see the person you love suffer. So he sees where you're suffering. It's like the suffering of a dream. That's what it is. Krishna is seeing you're in this dreamlike state and you're thinking you're somebody else than who you actually are. And because of that, you're trying to enjoy based on this false identity. And therefore, you're suffering. So Krishna doesn't want us to see us suffer. So he wants you to get back fast. <laughs> and that'll make Krishna happy. That'll make Krishna happy. Each time a soul comes back to Krishna, he feels happy. <laughs> and therefore, the, the, the thing is, anyone who preaches Krishna consciousness and helps to bring others back, they become very dear to Krishna. So if you help doing the work 
of the spiritual master and Lord Chaitanya, then you become very dear to Krishna, and that'll guarantee you going back to Godhead. Maharaj, <laughs> uh, Maharaj, is it that uh, we are sleeping in the spiritual world? Like no, no, you're not sleeping in the spiritual, you're sleeping here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, because he it, said it's a dream. Like, you know, no, we're, here is the dreamlike state. There is the reality. There you know who you are, and you, you're with Krishna, and your activities are based on your actual spiritual identity, not something different. Here we take up all activities which are different than who we are. And we're, even the body we have is not, our, not necessarily our identity. It's not our identity. You can be a man in one life, you'd be a woman in the next life, you could be a dog in the next life. So the body is changing. So this is the dream here. Not the spiritual world, that's the reality. <laughs> and that reality is much greater than this place. <laughs> it says the spiritual world is three quarters the size of Everything in one quarter makes up the material world. Yeah. So this is just a small part of existence here in this material world. Very small. <laughs> okay, we have another question? Yeah. Uh, Maharaj, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful class. Maharaj, you were mentioning about uh, uh, having realizations, uh, like th uh, having theoretical understanding versus having realizations. So uh, it happens sometimes that uh, even after years of practicing uh, Krishna consciousness, uh, we we don't get uh, any such realizations, and uh, we get distracted by the uh, elements of Maya. So so what should we uh, do to uh, reach that stage of realization. Well, you're getting realizations as you continue with devotional service. The fact that you're still doing devotional service means that you're realizing that this is what you want, and this is good. You may not n notice your progress, but there is pro progress happening as long as you stay in devotional service. Sometimes it becomes noticeable where you can actually relinquish certain very strong attachments easily. And other times it's a gradual, it's gradually, you're gradually making progress. But stay in devotional service and eventually, through good association, you'll, uh, you'll come to more and more realizations. And you get realizations by reading scripture. You get realizations by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Yeah. These things happen. Devotees get them all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So looks like we have anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.